Greetings and salutations. This is A. Abdul Hadi with The Bitter Truth, where we may not have all the answers, but we're going to ask an awful lot of questions. Today, I've got a guest who ran for Austin Independent School District. That's what we call it here in Texas, Independent School District, ISD. And uh, he is a UT student majoring in poli-sci or government. He also um, is on several uh, different um, committees and things that – and he also writes for The Daily Texan. And uh, my guest today is Zach Price. He ran for District 4 at AISD. And uh, we're going to jump into it right away. Zach, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Good, man. Get close to the mic. Yeah, you got it. Not super close, but about like that. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent, man. Um, so let's talk. So how? So you ran last fall, but before we get into all that – um, who are you? How'd you get here? Obviously, you're a young man, so I'm not expecting this big history of a log cabin, but you know, why don't you talk to us a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, uh, I grew up in Tennessee, Chattanooga. It's in southeastern Tennessee. I actually went to, in Tennessee, this school called Normal Park, um, which when I went there was something no one had heard of. And by the time I left was the number one magnet school in the country. Wow. Um, and being able to, so our principal uh, at Normal Park actually ended up serving as an education advisor to President Obama when he was in office. Um, and so being able to to be at a school like that and see uh, the type of educational outcomes you can create in a, in a community with poor education mm-hmm. um, was inspiring. And it, it made me, it, over time, I've thought more and more about uh, you know the the opportunities that have been given to me, but also the differential opportunities uh, provided to to people um, in my community there, in my community here in Austin. So after that, I lived in Alabama for a few years. I moved to Austin uh, my freshman year of high school. I t- attended L. C. Anderson High School in Northwest Austin, um, which is where I ended up running uh, for Austin ISD School Board. It was the district covering my old high school, um, and my run was based largely off of what I had seen and what I hadn't seen when I was a student, a lack of representation for for students, especially um, on the school board and in government at large, uh, but also just not enough opportunities in my mind for students of color, uh, for people from low-income backgrounds uh, in our school district. Uh, So I'm a student at the University of Texas. I work there I do a lot of work with um, some nonpartisan organizations uh, working on voter registration and civic engagement, uh, registering students to vote. Uh, We helped get a second polling location on campus last year. Uh, which was something we were really excited about. Uh, work on some some initiatives, tr- working with other uh, public universities um, a- across the South, uh, working on the you know, civic engagement on those campuses as well, helping those campuses do what we've been able to do at UT, the success we've been able to have. Uh, and uh, I also help work with an organization uh, that works with English as a second language students at local high schools. Okay. All right. So, okay, so talk to me a little bit. I mean, I'm not too familiar with all of the demographics. Um I live in a weird area. I live in Hyde Park, so I've got you know I, I kind of overlap districts two, six, and five. Yeah, and I don't have kids, you know, <laughs> but it's just kind of I know where I live. So um, I also know who my 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 district uh, uh, representative is for the state of Texas. Her name is Gina Hinojosa, and she did endorse you. Uh, she's and, wonderful. Yeah. So <laughs> and actually, quick side note, I almost I was thinking about running against her uh. um, in 2017 before the thing, and I just moved here, and some some folks are trying to recruit me to run against her, and I was and then I looked into her thing. I was going, she's actually kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like, why am I going to harsh your buzz, man? She's like doing stuff. Like, like yeah. you know, like I'm going to come in. I'm just a loudmouth dickhead. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I could offer any more to the community. So, um, okay. So, what what is your makeup in district four? I mean, because obviously, you're if you if you were if you were to win the election, it would have been uh, for the entire board, not just your district. You just would obviously have been representing your district. But you know, simple part first. What kind of a makeup is District Four? Because it strikes me as largely like largely white. Is that wrong? Uh, no, that's not wrong. Okay. Uh, it is. It is largely white. It is it is the uh, w- w- one of the whiter and wealthier areas of Austin. It represents a lot of Northwest Austin, Northwest Hills, okay. um, uh, and you know that's that that's the area that I went to high school in, and that's what I wanted to represent. But there are also other students in that community and sure. what happens when you have a school that is say 55% white 45% minority like Anderson and it's pretty similar to the demographics of McCallum as well 
uh, is that the school internally ends up being pretty segregated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, and that, that's a lot of what you see in high school is, is when you have AP and IB classes, advanced placement and international baccalaureate classes, the advanced classes, what ends up happening is the white and Asian students often track into those classes and Hispanic and African-American students track into the lower level classes. Mm-hmm. And so you see lower graduation rates, lower uh, success rates on, on SAT, mm-hmm. on AP and IB classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for students of color. Okay, and so why and why do you think that is? I mean, that's a big question, and I don't want to spend a whole hour on that because that's an hour. That is it's an hour that's, question. That's, I mean, but that's, wh- that's a few weeks. Maybe. Yeah, that's yeah. Because I, I taught school for a yeah. while at LAUSD, which we can jump into in a minute because sure. they just went on strike today. Absolutely. Um, I got friends in that district still, and I I substitute taught for about three years. And the interesting thing about that was um, I was on a long term sub license or whatever. I had my 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 C best, but I never took the credential. Didn't have to because we had a long term subbing thing for thirty days. So I would be in a class for 28 days. They would pull me out and then put me back in three days later. So they, they didn't, especially in South Central, they didn't have to hire anybody and nobody wanted to go down there. So I was working there for about a year before I got out and started working at some other schools. But I ask, I, I say a lot to say this, um, how, how could you try, how could, what could be done aside from getting into some home lives, what could be done to help these kids track better in AP classes, for example, or not even AP classes, but track better in general. I mean, are, yeah. I mean, is, if I'm understanding you correctly, scores are generally lower. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, basically across the metrics you look at, we're not succeeding at equal rates for all of our students. And that and that's true across Austin ISD, but it, it's especially true. And I'm pretty qualified to speak about it from the perspective of District 4 in Northwest Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the first thing you talk about is early intervention. Mm-hmm. And so the vast majority in District 4, the vast majority of um, African American Hispanic students come from one elementary school in District Four. It's Pillow Elementary. It feeds into Burnett Middle School, mm-hmm. which splits between uh, Anderson High School, mm-hmm. where I attended, and Lanier High School, which isn't in District Four. Mm-hmm. That middle school splits, and only the students from Pillow end up at Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the vast majority of the minority students that end up at Anderson come from that specific elementary school, which doesn't have the same resources and doesn't perform as well as the other elementary schools that feed in. Mm-hmm. So right away, you're starting kids off coming from a worse position no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it is the segregation we have as a city and we have as a school district. And we're far from the only city that has this, but there's – a great deal of segregation. I mean, no, everybody knows that that I thirty five is basically the, the dividing line in the city of Austin. Right. Um, and uh, what happens is that a, a mo- the majority of the schools that that predominantly serve African American Hispanic students don't perform as well. And a lot of that's because of a traditional lack of care provided by the district. And they're doing making steps now to improve that care, but it, it's hard to make up in a year for thirty years of neglect. Now, when you say it, well, that's a good point. So, but when you say care, do you mean money? Absolutely, money. But I mean, money comes from multiple places. You look at the the uh, PTAs at the the schools in Northwest Austin. They raise vast sums more money than the PTAs in East Austin. That allows them to to get some great things at those schools, but also it creates an an, an inequity in funding. Um, but we also correct, we also collect a property tax here. Isn't that supposed to be distributed equally? And it is distributed relatively equally. It wasn't always so. Okay. Um, so uh, you're talking about the problem is that you have there are some historical imbalances. Uh, in play here, and it's very hard to balance out the funding for five, ten years, and then say, "Well, all our problems are solved." Right. I, I think I'm, I'm of the perspective that until we have schools that are less segregated, you're not going to en- end up with uh, place- schools that perform better for all students. When you okay. have schools that desegregate, when you have schools that are integrated, um, students across the board, white, Hispanic, African American, Asian, perform better. Okay. And now, really quick, I want to because I want to get into the race a little bit. I want to get into to who you guys were running to replace because Julie Cowan was the board person before, right? She was. Um, so who is she? Uh, who, who was she? What did she do? Did, did you guys – obviously you both ran for the same seat. I'm not sure if either one of you had a problem with her or what have you, but what do you think of her? I mean, I didn't have any particular problem with Julie Cowan. I, I, my, my problem was more with the uh, district as a whole. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, that – that I saw, I mean, I saw an opportunity where we historically haven't provided students a voice uh, and a seat at the table um, in a community and at, at a government level where students are the people we're arguing about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to give students a chance across all of the boards and commissions in Austin ISD, and there are a bunch of them and hundreds of people that serve on them. There is 
exactly one student who serves on any of them. Her name's Sophie Ryland. She's mm-hmm. a senior at McCallum High. She's freaking brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, she's the only student serving on any of those boards. On the ma- vast majority of boards, they're making decisions that will impact students for decades, and they're not asking students how they feel about those issues. So that's the majority Are the of, students showing up? Um, I mean, we're not, you're not giving, being, giving the chance to show up. I, how do you mean? I didn't know that the that the Austin ISD had boards and commissions when I was a student. You can't expect 15 and 16 year olds to walk in knowing what the levers of power are in local government. You have to show them. You have to chart a path for sure. them. And there are places that do that. And in Austin, historically, we haven't done a very good job. Sure, of doing sure. It. But back to Julie Cowan. Yeah, yeah. Um, so no, I didn't have any particular problem with, with Julie Cowan. But I thought that from District Four, we could use uh, a trustee that was really going out and working with us. Uh, students in the community, but also going all over the city. I I mean, yes, you end up representing a specific district, but you have a commitment to the students all over the district. Um, And I think it would be fascinating to have a a board members who spend as much time as possible interacting with students in East Austin and South Austin, Central and North. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we could could have more of that on the board. Okay. Well, let me ask you something too. I mean, so um, when it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a charged word. So when you say segregation, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we think of dogs and fire hoses when you say that. So, like, in uh, at, at Anderson High School, for example, not the whole district, let's just say Anderson High School, What what? where did you see segregation occur? How did it occur? And was it like a – was it a conscious thing or was it just sort of people fell into their, their assumed roles? I and mean, what did you see? I mean, I don't think it's a conscious thing. Um, at some point in time, it definitely was. I think the problem is that for a while in, in cities in the South, it was a conscious effort, and we didn't make a f- enough of a conscious effort to, to fix the problem that mm-hmm. we created decades ago. Mm-hmm. Um, n- so, I mean, at a school like Anderson, it plays out by having advanced classes where where maybe there's one black student in the entire class. Mm-hmm. Um, in a class of 30, 35, and that student always feels out of place. It's, mm-hmm. it's really hard being the only student that looks like you in a class, mm-hmm. and that makes it harder for that student to perform better, and they're, they're the one that's succeeding. They're the one who's made it into the advanced track. Mm-hmm. And, and never mind all of the students who end up in the regular classes, which makes you less likely to graduate makes you less likely to end up in college. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't – I think the majority of it isn't conscious choices, but you have to – you have to – have um, administration and a district and and teachers and, and counselors at specific schools who are consciously trying to correct for biases that we have in our district where, I mean, study after study shows that teachers across all backgrounds think uh, – have, have worse perspectives on students of color. And if you – don't walk into a classroom trying to correct for that bias, then those students are going to do worse. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So what kind of program would you institute? And I, I want to get into other things too, but what kind of programs would you institute? And, and I say this because, um, you know, I can gripe. Mm-hmm. I taught I taught for a while. I was in an LAUSD and they're on strike today, rightfully so, mm-hmm. because people never believe me when I said we used to have 45, 50 kids to a class, but yeah. we did. In the, yeah. in the poor areas, we did for sure. So what kind of programs would you institute to, to make sure this integration happens? Because you can't just place a kid to fill a color quota. Yeah. That's been the challenge with affirmative action through the 80s and 90s is we left the policing system, which is what it was designed for, 100%. And people say it's not fair. Well, yeah, it's not fair because for hundreds of years, we held people down. And then we went to a policing system, which was fair. So if I had two master's candidates who had equal GPA, equal everything else, we were going to make sure that that guy wasn't being uh, – you know, lobbied against because he was a person of color. But then we kind of flipped the script for a while, uh, the 80s and especially into the 90s, where it became a quota system. You know, I, and I, I was in Claremont Graduate School for Education in the 90s. And I distinctly remember getting into debates with some of my fellow students about this very issue. And I would cite a statistic and I would say, listen, one of them is for the last four years, prior, prior to me getting into grad school, it's probably changed. But UC Berkeley, not exactly known as the bastion of right wing, uh, had an 85% dropout rate amongst affirmative action freshmen. And so one girl with a straight face told me, she goes, well, maybe Berkeley's hostile against minorities. I'm like, okay. I didn't say, you know, Oral Roberts University. I said UC Berkeley, right? And all to be fair that when I taught school, I saw the level of work that was getting done mm-hmm. in Los Angeles, for example. And I would see in, in some of the districts that I taught in when I was in grad school. And I would see some of the level of work that these kids were getting, and yet they were getting courted to go to go to the, attend these universities. And I'll just be very blunt. I was barely a B student in high school. I was taking my homework in my pocket. 
I'm a white guy. I would never have survived any university. I had to go to junior college first sure. to learn how to do homework. Yeah, you know, to learn how to like do math. I mean, I seriously, I, I it was a, the fact that I got a degree. I should get I, the Pope should give me a a, a, a sainthood. <laughs> I, if I could do a couple of card tricks, I think that counts as a miracle. <laughs> on top of it, because I should not have gotten a degree sure. at all. Absolutely. But all that to say that we you know we can't flip it to the other way and just fill bodies to fill them. So what kind of programs would you want to institute to, to make sure that a, a fair integration that's also fair to the student in question because we're not helping them? Sure. I mean, you, you'd you move toward uh, the, not necessarily a quota system, but from the elementary school level on up, identifying students of color who have promise who might end up being able to, to fill AP and IB classes. Okay. Make that a conscious effort moving forward. Um, because often when you when you rely on the status quo, that's when you have problems, especially when the, when we're talking about school districts um, and a city that, that has these problems with segregation. Another thing that I think is fascinating, probably politically untenable, but something that should be looked at um, is, uh, is rapid scale desegregation of the type that we looked at in the 70s and 80s. And there are some school districts, uh, Dallas ISD and Louisville ISD in Kentucky are two of that have uh, attempted this recently and been extraordinarily successful in doing so, um, is uh, bringing back desegregation with student choice with student choice. Mm -hmm. So students across the district identify their priority schools that they would like to attend. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the district basically assigns numbers uh, to the neighborhoods those students attend, a one, two, three, or four, based on the uh, accommodation of factors that indicate how wealthy that neighborhood is. Mm -hmm. And then they disperse those students relatively evenly across the district by their economic status. Um, and what that does is it controls, it makes it not just race-based, but it makes it economic-based affirmative action. And their results um, have shown that they're not just desegregating schools, which they are, mm -hmm. uh, but that student performance is improving when they do so. And that students and parents are largely happy with the results of this program, even though it means longer transportation times for some, even though it means breaking up traditional neighborhood schools sometimes. Mm -hmm. okay. And when you say breaking up traditional neighborhood schools, you mean from the elementary level? or what do you mean? I mean, it's elementary, middle, and high school level. Okay. You do it across all grades uh, because, I mean, just desegregating at one level doesn't help. You, you need to, you need to students perform better when they see more students like them in the classroom and students that don't look like them in the classroom across all all 15 years of their career. Well, I mean, career, and, and, and I, I mean, I, it, um, I, mean, I don't mean to minimize what you're saying. I, I, sure. I, I agree with you on a large part, but then I went to a very integrated school. I grew up in South Central. Mm -hmm. And this was South Central in the 70s. Right, so it's it was different than now, and I'd say we had, if I'm if my if my old time fifty five year old too much diet coke Nutri sweet ate my brain away memory serves, um, it was about a third third third, mm -hmm. and I'd say we had maybe thirty percent white thirty percent black thirty percent Mexican Hispanic because we had kids from El Salvador everywhere else, and then um, you know everyone else you know the other you know I, I'm, my dad's from the Middle East you know my mom's Brazilian so I was part of the other we had Asian kids, um, Korea you know, South Korea China. Um, so that was part of the other. So, it, it, but but largely it was that way too because everyone's parents pretty much worked at the same places: GM, Ford, Firestone. We used to have a lot of union jobs where I grew up, and as those jobs evaporated, then the demographic got more homogenous. So that now where I grew up is all 100% Latino, and it's like a 57% dropout rate. Last stat I saw was about five years ago, my old school. So. You know, uh, how how can we ensure that, uh, you know, people that look like me makes it easier for me to, you know, do better in school? And is that a real statistic? Because there's a ton of communities where not only we're not pouring money into them, but there's kids that look just like them and they're, and, and they're not doing great. And then the AP levels there are not the same as, you know, AP, an AP level at, uh, at Huntington Park High School in California is not the same AP level to where you went. No. Guaranteed. Absolutely. So how how can we guarantee? How can guarantee is a bad word because there's no there's no such thing. But how do you how do you pr create a program where these kids are going to get the best that they can get that, that the white kids get? Let's yeah. just say it. 
I mean, there there are no guarantees. Um, what you're talking about is if you have schools that that desegregate, where, schools where there is a relatively balanced mix, then there has to be buy-in from the community at large to make sure that each of those schools is successful. Mm-hmm. What happens when you have a segregated city and a segregated school district is that um, the people that hold the most power, the people that hold the most wealth in uh, our city and in our school district can prioritize those schools that that have their kids, that have their friends' kids at them. Mm -hmm. If those students end up dispersing relatively evenly across the district the same way African-American and Hispanic and Asian students do, uh, then there has to be buy-in on every single school that Lanier will have to have the same services that Anderson does. And so moving on, um, okay, so you ran against uh, Kirsten Ash. Chris, I'm sorry, Kristen Ash. I keep saying Kirsten. Um, and she's a teacher and she's been around the block a bit. Mm-hmm. So, and she's done stuff with, you know, poor kids and disadvantaged kids. And, you know, the kind of thing that I, I would hope a, a board member or, or would be board member would want to do, you know, and we can jump into the LAUSD criminality of it. But, um, yeah. but so where do you see your qualifications? Because, I mean, let's get into your background. What, 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 um, uh, managerial and or legislative and or building and or whatever the fuck experience you need to be a board member do you have at 20, right, um, to do this gig that is not a partisan gig, but I see that you're, you know, you're endorsed by everybody that's a Democrat in the state of uh, Texas. I mean, sure. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, did you get endorsed by Julian Castro? I did get endorsed by Julian. How the fuck did that happen? The guy's running for <laughs> president of the United States, and he's got time to endorse you. So, so yeah. okay, so, because I, because I thought I saw that yes. a few months back, which is what got my attention. Sure. That's why I started calling you. Because like, what the fuck is this kid <laughs> who's getting endorsed by Julian Castro? Mm-hmm. And I was going, and then it kind of went away. And I was going, okay, maybe, and this happens. I had a deja vu. I had a dream. Yeah. And, and, I, and, you know, I, I did a lot of drugs back in the day. So maybe that, I'm having a flashback. You know, you know, maybe Barack Obama endorsed you too. I had no idea. So no, n- not yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it, and not ever. God help you at that. <laughs> um, but so how how that happened? So okay, so yeah. so these endorsements you got, like uh-huh. what what background do you have that like gets these glowing endorsements? Because it, you know, I was just like, yeah. I have no idea. Well, I mean, I'm excited to be the next Secretary of Education. That's going to be fun. Yeah, you'll um, do in the Castro than, regime, yeah. Dude, dude honestly, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass for a little bit here in the next 20 minutes, but I, I would tab you over <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the well, knotheads. <laughs> I was on the swim team. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah ugh, shit, don't get me started on that chick. Sure. But, um, but no, so, so let's get into that. Yeah. Well, um, no, I and me running for office doesn't come from a place of arrogance. I am 20 years old. I never ran from that fact the entire campaign. Um, I know that I could not possibly present the traditional credentials that most people running have because I'm about 20, 25 years short on life experience there. Mm -hmm. And so and that turns some people off. And I understand that completely. At the same time, I would have been the only member of the Austin ISD board had I been elected to have attended one of our schools in the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the type of experience that I brought in. But I I also had qualifications that are non-traditional for a 20 year old coming from all over the place. Like what? Like what? I, I worked at the Texas legislature uh, for uh, Rep. Guillen, uh covering South Texas, and then sorry, in, who? Rep. Rep. Uh, Ryan Guillen covering Guillen. South okay. Texas, and then in Senator Watson's office last special session. Doing doing what and for how long? Um, uh, well, just for the duration of special session, effectively for the summer. Um, I mean, answering uh, constituent stuff, helping helping constituents out, but also researching bills, uh, working with them on their priorities for the special session, trying to trying to keep things tamped down uh, and make sure that special session was about as sane as it could have been, which they largely succeeded. That's a lot of the stuff that they wanted to get, th- that Dan Patrick wanted to get through last special session didn't. Um, and a lot of that's because of the work done uh, by Senator Watson and the other, the other okay, Democrats. So when you say like Texas tamping Senate. down and, 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 excuse me, and no offense, and by the way, um, like I said, no offense, but when you say tamping down, mm-hmm. is the state legislature that bereft that they got to get an unpaid intern who's a second year government major at UT. <laughs> No, so I'm just no, like, you know, no, no, no. I just saw a thing like, let's raise these guys' pay. Are they not paying them enough? And, and, and so, no, how, you know. No, they have great staff there. But I mean, I got to, uh, I got to help out. And and to their credit, they they were they're willing. One of the offices that's willing to actually give uh, interns and give young people a chance to to help to sure. attend meetings, to to research bills, to to help out in any way that's possible. Okay. And so, it, I mean, a lot of it ends up becoming legitimate work. It's not just drafting letters and and all that. It, it's okay. it's serious important. 
important work. Uh, in Rep. Gann's office, I handled health and human services and veterans policy uh, for their office. Um, when you say handle, what, what, what does that mean? Get um, I mean, so they had a huge team of interns in that office, and state reps have really small budgets, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they had three, four paid staffers. Uh, it ends up not being enough to cover yeah everything that comes through. So mm-hmm. they basically, they would have teams of interns work on different policies. Mm-hmm. I helped lead the teams uh, for health and human services and veterans policy, keeping track of every bill that was getting filed, helping assign uh, basically the way that, that we would recommend that the representative vote on that based on his, his policy preferences. Okay, so how, that, how does that feed into, um, as a for instance, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I know uh, Ashy, the, the teacher lady, mm-hmm. um, you know, she's been on different things. Sure. Right. So she's done different. Like, so how does that experience help you? For example, like I remember one of the things you said you wanted to do was build another elementary school. Right. So how does that help you get into the bonds and get in all that politics? Because it's not a lot of board members. Mm-hmm. There's what is eight of you? Sixty? Nine. nine of you guys. Okay. So nine of you guys, and you got to go to the, you got to go to the county in a right to work state. And I want to get into that in a second. But you know, in a right to work state where not only are you trying to get more money for the teachers, which you know it it's almost. Never happens. I mean, I work with you know with uh, Travis County Sheriff's, for example, and they haven't had a raise in thirteen years, sure, because it's right to work state, and the state can just go fuck you, and that's what they do. So how how well, how does this experience translate into you being uh, because obviously you're running because you think you're better qualified, right? So how does that translate into that? Sure. Um, I mean, it, that that experience translates. It, it's government experience. Uh, I. I'm not claiming to be uh, the a perfect legislative insider. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> I worked as an intern at the legislature, but relatively, I understand the way it works. Um, I I have worked with state rep- representatives, Representative Ino, uh, Gina Inahosa, for example, mm-hmm. um, I- in the past, um, and uh, you know, it was my goal to use that knowledge I had, the experience I had, to go up to the legislature and really fight for our schools and for our students here in Austin ISD. And I think that's something that I hope Austin ISD takes advantage of this session is uh, the ability to fight because there there are some school districts that that end up very well representative at the represented at the legislature and they don't just end up in the committee room testifying mm-hmm. they're brought in when people want to draft bills right. Austin ISD isn't one of those school districts right, and it right. should be right um, and so going up there and making our voices heard in as loud and aggressive a way as possible um, I think can only be beneficial to us uh, at this point in time mm-hmm. we need to to fight and push forward because we're we're rapidly losing both students and funding. Um, and that's not sustainable as a school district. And that's why the school district and the board of trustees are having to look at, at all of these politically untenable options right now uh, is because we've run out of places to cut. And with the, there, it's got to give at some point there has to be an increase in funding that can really only come from the state legislature. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that experience I have working there, working – I also uh, worked in Mayor Adler's office. Uh, what did you do for him? Uh, I mean, I worked uh, f- uh, doing constituent services for a while, but also basically just anything they needed me to do. I was actually the first intern in his, in his office mm-hmm. after he got elected mm-hmm. uh, when I was still in high school mm-hmm. um, and basically just re- uh, researched policy. I got to work on uh, policy revolving around homelessness and revolving around a, a bunch of issues um, that you end up seeing in front of the school board as mm-hmm. well. Sure. Um, and just having been behind the scenes both those places, you understand what gets legislation up in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's that's the biggest thing. Mm-hmm. If you can't figure out how levers of power work from the inside, it's very hard to pull them. Now, how does student mobility play into a district like District 4? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. How does student mobility play ah. into a district like District 4? And, and, and that's a euphemism for kids got to move because, you know, something happened with the rent or whatever. It's like, you know, it's most, if student mobility mostly affects the poor kids, yeah. to be honest. And so, mm-hmm. so the district, uh, the, 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 the district not, the, not the ISD, but the district itself ends up losing money because if the, district, if the kids move out of, say, District 4 into District 2, mm-hmm. now District 2 is getting all that state funding yeah. because those bodies are showing up there. And not, but, the, but the parents have to move out of District 4 because, let's say, they're you know, two families to an apartment. Landlord busted them. Now they got to move. And so they move to, say, the other side of 35, Yeah. right? And so now District uh, 6 or 5 or whatever it is gets those kids and you guys don't. So mm-hmm. how does student mobility play into that? And, like, what kind of programs did you did, did you want to try to institute to, to make that happen? That's a great question. Um, so uh, District 4 is, uh, as we already acknowledged, one of the wealthier districts mm-hmm. in the in the city. Normally what you see play out isn't people going from District 4 across to District 6, and this is why Austin ISD has such a big problem. It's it's students going from District 4 up to Cedar Park ISD to Round Rock mm-hmm. ISD to Leander ISD. Okay. Um, and when that happens, we're not getting the money anymore. Right. Right. Those school districts have been expanding, and it's because they've been eating a lot of our students. Um, and 
you know, until we find a way to correct for that, we're going to – that's why the school district as, as a whole is keeps losing money as we're losing students to charter schools um, and to the, the outlying school districts in the suburbs. Uh, you know, as far as student mobility, you know, it is one of the wealthier districts, but there are still pockets of uh, of the district that um, that are rapidly increasing in value, including uh, where where my family lives up at, at Mopac and Palmer Lane. It's mm-hmm. the edge uh, right before you you uh, hit M- McNeil High School and Round Rock ISD, um, and because of the Apple campus that's being built uh, and all that out there, that's rapidly going to move from. Uh, low to middle income housing to to high income housing um, that, that's basically only being used by tech employees in the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to keep seeing pockets of middle middle income housing move away from that. And, and District 4 is going to go from a middle to high income district to a high, high income district. Uh, um, it, it, unless we do something in the next 10, 20 years. Okay. Well, let me, so, okay. So, and, you know, again, uh, I'm I'm asking because you know, hey, you ran, right? You you yeah. you, you wanted the gig, and uh, you know, in any job interview, I mean, I'm sure people listening is going, "You're a fucking asshole. You're beating up on a 20 year old kid." First of all, you're not a fucking kid. You're brighter than that. Number one, number two, if politics is going to be your life, trust me, when you're 90, I'll be the nicest person you've ever met. <laughs> all right, all right. You'll be on your deathbed going, "Hey," and your grandkids don't even know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> so anyway, um, but you know, all that to say, so what kind of programs would you? want to what what kind of what kind of designs on programs did you want to introduce to the board sure to combat some of what you're talking about yeah because this stuff is not like platitude nancy pelosi crap or mitch mcconnell you know stuff you know we, we, you know it, like, like war to the state shit this is like stuff that you have obviously have to have a specific design or it's just going to flame out yeah i mean absolutely there's unfortunately there isn't an easy solution to these problems these are these are uh <laughs> contentious issues that uh, that have been talked about for decades and we haven't found good solutions. Uh, I think that on an issue like this, when you're talking about a lack of housing, forcing people out, that solution's got to come from the city. Mm-hmm. Um, and so working aggressively with city council uh, on affordable housing packages uh, a- and much more aggressive packages than we saw even right. in, the, in the bond package. I was glad to see the it, it being put up with the bonds this past election and that it succeeded, but we need to be incredibly aggressive about affordable housing, and we need to do it now mm-hmm. um, because people are being forced out. And sure, that could be a, a problem in District 4, but in East Austin, that is an even larger problem. Sure. You'll, see that, you'll see that affect uh, District 1. You'll see that uh, affect uh, Dr. Uh, Matthias's district, um, you know, much more than you'll see it affect District 4 and, and sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I know that it's a priority of the new council. Um, I'd like to see some aggressive affordable housing packages put up. And the other thing that you can do is, you know, Austin ISD does have some some uh, spaces that aren't being used. If you're going to sell those spaces off, it should be for affordable housing purposes. There should be, if you're going to sell them off, make sure requi- make it a requirement of the sale that affordable housing be put on the premises of those, of those campuses that are no longer in use. Well, let me ask you something. I mean, so how would the board... <coughs> um, and you probably said this in your answer, and I'm thick. So, but how would the board uh, help out with that? Aside from the city and the state, how how can the board aid that? Because obviously, your district, not. A, I mean, I got friends up in District Four. Sure. I, I know the drill. So, how? Do, but how do you help? You know, down District Two, Five, Six. You know, down 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 toward Manchac. You know, East, especially on East Manchac. So, like, how how do you help um, with affordable housing? How can the board? What kind of monies could the board come up with? That would help these people. I mean, there's not a lot of money the board can come up with, period. The school district is bleeding money. And most of that is because of the school funding system we have in the state of Texas, a recapture. Um, But there's not a ton of money that can be put up. But what you can do is lobby aggressively at the city level. What you can do is we can can make it a requirement that when district properties are sold, um, that we're selling them with – with affordable, the requirement that affordable housing be put in on the premises. That's that is money that the school district uh, can can put in kind mm-hmm. uh, to that issue. Uh, beyond that, it, it does. It comes down to making that a priority. And when elected officials lobby other elected officials, they happen to listen more often than when just people do. Mm-hmm. I mean, the other thing is going and talking to the people who are being displaced. Sure. That's it. Is sure. If your District 4 representative isn't going down and talking to people on East Manshack, uh, on Old Torf, anywhere that, that are being displaced, then they're not making decisions that are uh, – 
that are that are relevant to the real lives of those people, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. And we need a, a school board and we need representatives who are going out and making that effort regardless of whether or not they technically get elected by those people. So talk to me for a hot second too. Um, so – yeah, you, you got you got a shit ton of endorsements. It did, right? Like, um, I think I think your opponent had like three or four. You had like eleven or fifteen or something like that. Yeah. So, um, and you know, Julian Castro, mm-hmm. notwithstanding, which <laughs> you know, that's impressive. I saw the Polka King documentary last night on uh, on on Netflix. Yeah. You, did you see that? No. You got to watch it. It's 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 cool. a freaky ass story. It, okay. It'll blow your mind. But here's this guy from Poland taking pictures with George Bush and the Pope, and he's like, <laughs> he's like everywhere. I'm like, I can't, I can't, the mayor won't even talk to me. How does this polka guy with a thick Polish accent, right? So, you know, the, the, the whole Julian Castro of it is still fascinating. Oh, but, absolutely. But how, how does, ed, okay, educate Austin, Education Austin, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're a pack. And, you know, they put five grand into your campaign. And so what, um, what were they expecting of you to do that? They didn't, they didn't support your opponent in any way, I don't think, did they? No. Okay. So they supported you. Now, they're, they're, they're a teacher's union an ersatz teachers union because in Texas it's except for nine counties nobody has collective bargaining. Yeah, but they're, they're teachers union. They're teachers union, and so they're basically an association, and they get in front of the board every year. Hey, we need more money. No, mm-hmm. okay, great, and that's the end of it. And they wait five more years. And that's how every. That's not just them; it's everybody. Yes, because only nine counties in all of 254 counties in Texas that have collective bargaining. Everybody else is right to work, which means they get right to be stooped in the butt. Okay, yes, absolutely. So, what were they expecting of you, and what were you going to do for the teachers? Say or want to do for the teachers that got them enthusiastically to endorse you. Yeah. I mean, not there, your opponent. There, there's no, like, <laughs> there was no underhanded agreement or anything like that. And what, what I did is they invited every candidate up for office this year on one of the school board elections to come address them as a group. And they asked us a series of pointed questions mm-hmm. and then we left and they deliberated and right. they gave us a phone call. Okay. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking <laughs> about like you're the mafia. No, yeah, no, I understand. But no, I, I just no, want to, this isn't yeah. like, you know, Tony Soprano, he knows the <laughs> yeah, union guy. Yeah. I'm not talking about yeah. what did they think you were going to do for them? Yeah. Because they're not going to give you the money out of the goodness of their heart. No. They are a pack. They do have needs. Yes. So where, what did they see in you versus your candidate or your opponent rather that they saw that you were going to help them? Yeah. In a way that helped – and by the way, this is help teachers, by the way. This mm-hmm. isn't like the, the Teamsters Union where you're burying guys in cement. This is teachers who could use more money. Absolutely. We don't pay them enough. Absolutely. So what did they see in you that 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 you know garnered their, their endorsement? I mean I think they liked uh, the fact that, I, that I'm aggressive about my priorities, that I was saying we're going to go down to the legislature and not just talk. We're going to fight. Mm-hmm. We're going to fight for teachers. We're going to make sure that out of this next session we see better school funding. And I'm so excited to see that both the Texas House and Senate have proposed greater teacher funding already um, for this for this next session. I mm-hmm. hope it works out the way we want it to. Well, let me ask you, okay, because you know, in the election, it was yeah. like, it was it was the numbers were, were staggering. I mean, it was like sixty seven to thirty three yeah. to your opponent. Okay, yeah. so what could you do other than go down there and fight? Like, would you want to say, for example, bring before the board collective bargaining that educate Austin? Education Austin could go conceivably before the board as a collective bargaining unit and 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 have things a new contract. For example, LAUSD is striking today. Those guys are all getting paid. It's a lesser day rate, but they're all getting paid. And they're also collecting unemployment. Right. That's in their contract. Yeah. And that's because California is a collective bargaining state. Right. Now, San Antonio, Bear County, for example, is collective bargaining. Mm-hmm. So the teachers can do that down there. Yeah. The sheriffs can do that down there. The fire can do that down there. The cops yeah. can do that down there. Up here, we can't. Right. And people always confuse right to work. It's a, it's a nice euphemism. So like how, how could you or what would you – if you did win, what would you have wanted to do mm-hmm. to get this in front of the board to turn this into say a right to work school district, for example? Or I, I'm sorry, collective bargaining school district. I mean and that wasn't, that wasn't a hard stop conversation we had. But I'm absolutely in favor of labor and specifically teachers having the right to, to bargain for their own contracts. And right. because – especially because of how poorly they've been treated here in the state of Texas, sure. they've earned that right. Um, so, I mean, I always would – I would always be a, a solid vote um, in favor of anything that will increase teacher pay, increase their right to, to advocate 
um, for themselves, period. Um, and so, I mean, that was that was the conversation we had. And I, I got some questions along those lines, and that's how I answered them. Um, but there was never, there wasn't ever a uh, like a, a solid conversation about specifically what we were going to do. More letting them know what my priorities were. That I stand with teachers absolutely and unequivocally. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends who are young teachers. It's a tough profession, um, especially here in Austin. Some of the best teacher, young teachers that I had when I went to Anderson, no longer teach at Anderson. Mm-hmm. Um, because they can't afford to live here, because they're not making much money, because we're not providing enough support for young teachers. They feel uh, isolated. They feel alone. They do feel like they don't have resources. Mm -hmm. They're leaving to Colorado and Arizona and other states to go teach. Mm -hmm. Um, And I can't blame them. Um, I can't either. It's notorious how they got to pay out of pocket for shit they shouldn't be paying out of pocket for. We can go blow up a brown country with no problem. Right. And so, but again, um, how how do you get those teachers protected? How do we? Because you know you just you just rattle off a ton of people you know that are splitting into better districts, yep. green, greener pastures, and we just had West Virginia and Oklahoma mm-hmm. strike and get their way. They did absolutely, and so and those are right to work states, mm-hmm. by the way. Um, so you got to pull the numbers, right? So like how how do you think as a board member? Because now your management, and we all know what happens when labor plays golf with management, right? right. So how would you how would you work that balance? To get these guys their way while you're maintaining the best interest of the district because also obviously the district has to make money or if it goes broke, it's insolvent, it's out of business. The best interests of the district are for to have teachers happy, have them paid well, and have them stay with the district. When you have high teacher turnover, then you you have lower student success, period. Mm-hmm. And, and so making sure that my fellow trustees – saw that would have been my, one of my top priorities. And, and, how we, and how would you have done that better than your opponent? Uh, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I feel like I'm, I'm closer to the teachers. That's why I, I had their endorsement. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I sit down in a room full of young teachers and I identify with what they, with what they talk about. I've, I've worked at schools, at five different schools in Austin as independent school district as a volunteer, mm-hmm. um, a, a, along with nonprofit organizations like Communities and Schools and Austin Partners in Education. I was mm-hmm. an AmeriCorps Vista at uh, Austin Partners in Education last, last summer. I, I was effectively a young teacher for that period of time. Um, what they do is incredibly difficult. Sure. Um, and I can sit down with them and, and commiserate. I know exactly what they're going through um, because I also have to find rent in that part of Austin right. uh, uh, so that they're not driving an hour out of their way. You right. know, that that's the, the type of issues when you have to confront them firsthand, mm-hmm. it's more personal. And and so when it comes time to consider a new contract, you can, you can provide that firsthand perspective. And w- I think what we've seen increasingly uh, in this city is representation that looks more like us and, and talks uh, more personally about the issues facing us, especially with the, with the new 10-1 council from mm-hmm. five years ago now um, that – seeing that, I think we could use that same type of leadership on the school board of people. There's not a single renter serving on the Austin ISD board. Everyone is a homeowner. Mm -hmm. When you have that perspective, you know, you can still talk about, about affordable housing, but you don't, none of the people there are impacted by the inability to find inexpensive apartments while every young teacher in our district is. That's Mm -hmm. the type of, of firsthand knowledge that, that we're lacking in our representation here. And you think you would have been better than your opponent on that? Uh, I mean, absolutely. Because I, again, I live it. I have lived it. I will continue to live it. Mm -hmm. And everyone I know does. But she knows teachers too, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure she does. Uh-huh. Um, and did you guys ever have a debate? Uh, no, there weren't debates. I don't, yeah, we, a I lot of forums I, I, that we were both at. Okay. Um, I, 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 yeah, I tried following. Yeah, all this, <laughs> to say, to try, it's like last year was kind of kook pants though. But yeah, uh, but no, but you had like three folks run. Mm-hmm. I think, and I'm re- I was re- I'm researching like like three different shows at the same time. But yeah, like three folks run, and two out of the three chose to run at large versus run in that district. Yes. Right. So is that is that accurate? Uh, so, yeah, there were two candidates in our race. There were three in the at-large one. There are a couple of other races okay. on the city. All right. So, like, so, um, uh, you know, so, I mean, and, here, and here's the thing, and I don't mean to, to you know, to uh, necessarily beat up on this, but sure. and th- that the reason I ask is because there's a lot of folks in this woke movement, unfortunately, and you're a young guy, so you have no idea from crap from 20 years ago because you were born 20 years ago. So, That's correct. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of folks, and it doesn't sound like you do this. It sounds like you're a little bit more thoughtful than this, but I see a lot of folks that kind of get the idea to do this. I was at a progressive thing about two weeks ago and people my age, by the way, 
And it, it was as though they thought that politics began on January 22nd, 2017, that there was <laughs> nothing for the previous 70 years that would make anybody vote for an orange game show host who was – couldn't even – I wouldn't even let him pick my couch, <laughs> right? But then who did he run against? The other person who was like – participated in the biggest electoral fraud in the history of ever. But we swept that under the rug because, oh, she's – why is she better? If she had an R next to her name, you'd have paid attention to the fact that she is a goddamn war criminal and took money from everybody. But yet here we were because it's my personal opinion that if Bernie Sanders ran against Rand Paul, the country's IQ would have gone up by 15 points. Seriously, because maybe they would have thrown a little mud at each other. Sure. You know, maybe maybe Bernie would have attacked Rand and said, you were late to that PTA meeting. And then Rand would have said, oh, yeah, well, you, you mowed your neighbor's lawn on accident and chopped down his tree. That would have been the biggest scandal you would have heard. No, no pussy grabbing, no nothing, right? Mm-hmm. We ended up with these two knotheads and just t- totally took the discourse down, 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 down. Absolutely. So if I – and so this isn't your fault, but it, so this is why I'm I asking. I hope that's not my fault. No. Yeah. <laughs> but this is why, you know, I dig into this a little bit when people decide they want to run because it's a big responsibility. Absolutely. So um, so with, with right to work in general, let's, let's, get, let's get out of the, the race. It's over. It's been done. But let's, let's get into like what your thoughts are on, say, right to work versus collective bargaining. You know, how, how can the district move past, move past where we're at now? You know, where Educate Austin obviously saw something in you mm-hmm. to endorse you. Where could we go in a district, much less the state? But how could we get the district to change, excuse me, the policies where a, a, an outfit like Education Austin is largely an association? Yeah. They're not a union. They're not a union in the New York and California sense. No. And those of you that are listening to this show right now and you're thinking, you know, well, you're from California, land of fruits and nuts and blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you a couple of things that we do right in California. I've been here four years. Love Texas, love Austin. There's a couple of things we do right. A, we drive better than y'all. We know how to lane merge. Y'all don't know how to do that. True sure. story. Yeah. And the other part is you think right to work is a good thing. And we have it baked in the brain in this state. That if you have a union and you're allowed to have somebody negotiate, God forbid, I'm forced to for, – the word's forced. You know how much the union costs in California, UTLA, how much that costs to join? 30 bucks a month. 30 bucks a month. And when I was there, I had the most stellar health insurance in my life. I, you know how much I paid for that? $30 a month. Wow. For my, my, my contribution was $30. I, 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 it's, it's not that way for most employees. Most employees can't even get their spouse covered these days. Right. UTLA still covers the spouse and the kids at no charge to the teacher. That's because they got a contract, and that's because they have collective bargaining. Yeah. So how do you bring that into AISD? I mean, it's harder because we're not in California. We're in Texas, mm-hmm. and uh, Texas is a notoriously anti-union state, right. and, and that's not changing in the next two years. Um, you know, uh, it's harder. you you got to ensure that the school, uh, that, that the union, that the association, whatever you want to call them, the Education mm-hmm. Austin, right. has a seat at the table, period, that they're getting the chance to negotiate um, with – uh, with the school board, with the with the superintendent, uh, as much as state law will allow them to, mm-hmm. um, you know, w- when you're looking at other districts like San Antonio that that have w- with Bear County mm-hmm. um, that have uh, that have better union representation than we have here, mm-hmm. it's it's time to emulate them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, and when you're talking about fighting on behalf of teachers at the Texas legislature, that's part of what you're talking about mm-hmm. is making sure that. That uh, that union representation is part of the the agreement because no, union is often used as a dirty word and a catch-all in Texas politics when people want a punching bag. But when you talk about it being the teacher at their kid's elementary school, people think a little bit differently about it. Right. Um, and so making sure that that you're emphasizing that at the very least, teachers' unions should have the right to collectively bargain unambiguously. Um, you know, I think there there's more room to work with that. Uh, than anything else at the legislature, because in the last year or so, teachers have shown out in force uh, just how dangerous they can be in elections um, when, right. when they want to vote in block, when they want to make their voices heard. Um, and I I sure hope they continue to do so. Well, I'll give you an example. So Bear County, sure. that wasn't deigned to them by the county supervisors. It was not something that like, you know, all of a sudden Supervisor X said, hey, uh, you know, you all need collective bargaining. That was something that the Bear County Sheriff's Association got on the ballot and it wasn't just for their association it was for everybody mm-hmm. nurses everybody yeah. and then they got all the associations together mm-hmm. the teachers the fire everybody and they lobbied like they were running for president they're out there kissing babies shaking hands do, shaking babies kissing hands whatever they did everything 
right, to make sure that that got passed on the ballot. It's been about six years now. Sure. So where's the force here? Because I don't see that. Uh, I see a lot of people waiting for the legislature or the city council to finally go, yeah, hey, or the Travis County supervisors to go, yeah, hey, it's cool. It's never going to come that way. No. Because you're, you're government major. We've never had a right given to us by anybody. It, it's been by by fight. Yeah. Women Showing got the right need to need it. Yeah. G- women got the right to vote. Not because all of a sudden, you know, Calvin Coolidge thought it was a good idea or Warren G. Hardy thought it was a good idea. It was – that was passed because women protested for years and years and years. Women's suffrage movement, slavery abolished because of protest. You know, Lincoln didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And then he finally got dragged to doing it. You know, and yeah. the Republican Party got started as an abolitionist party. People forget that. Yeah. But so all of that to say, wh- what do you see here in Austin or Travis County that's moving forward? Because now there's, there's some tide. There's some people who are paying attention to every election now, all the way down to state assembly. They're like just – everything so like what do you see happening i mean i don't i'll be honest with you i don't know about the inside picture i know that there are a lot of unions in in travis county and austin that work together pretty well um i don't know how uh, the teachers union how at austin works with the sheriff's union or the or the police union uh but you know i'm, I'm sure that's a conversation they've had mm-hmm. uh you know I, I mean at the end of the day uh, it would it would take working together. It would take that type of countywide initiative. I don't know what uh, I don't know about the state of le- like the legal state uh, of a ballot question like that in Travis County. Maybe sure. you know better than I do, but probably not by much. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, if it's a if that's a question, if that's something that can be put out there, that's something that should be put out there. Sure, um, it, it should be. Uh, you know, I mean, at the same time, um, not all unions are created equal, and and when you group all unions together and they they work together on issues um, like that, then it, you know it it makes it harder for them to say no. We're the ones that like that you have to listen to. So when you're talking, we're just talking about like, the teachers union in the Texas legislature. It, I mean, unions are incredibly powerful when they when they work together. But at the same time, grouping them all together, putting the teachers union and the police union together will, and working together will mean that there are some people who are going to be angry at the teachers union. Sure. Um, and that, that's a reality you have to talk about. Excuse me. And you brought this up a second ago because the – and it just kind of reminded me of what you just said. Sure. The people are being – to be angry at the teachers union, but you're not angry at the teachers union when it's your kid in that school. So what is it – because I want to ask you another another question in wrapping up. we got about maybe 10 minutes left. But right. So what is it do you see – and this is a bigger picture, but you're government majors or poli-sci majors, so I'm counting on you to give us a smart answer. So what is it about folks that have it so baked in the brain, for example – because I'm from L.A. I've got a lot of friends that who, whose kids fit in a certain district <clears throat> or part of the part of the district. And, you know, they have no problem with charter schools, right? And they don't want to submit their kids, subject their kids to the experiment that is LAUSD. Because in some parts, LAUSD is awesome. I taught in some of those parts. Some of those parts, I wouldn't let those schools raise cactus, right? So how does that happen that, you know, we, we have this, this complete divorce of compassion and empathy? Um. That's hard. Can you give me a little bit more what you're going for there? Yeah, because, I mean, how is it that I could sit there and bitch, bitch, bitch about charter schools and everything else, but then if my kid's in a decent school, I want that school to have funding, right? I mean, but yeah. but, but then if my kid's not in that school, fuck those kids. I want my kid in a better school. I want my kid in a charter school. Mm-hmm. I want to use public funds for the charter school, but I don't want you, – you follow what I'm going? I, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, because what, we're all selfish. That's <laughs> that's that's your, your best answer. Is everybody's selfish? Everybody wants their interest to win out. Um, and uh, the the problem we have with institutions like charter schools um, isn't necessarily they exist. It's that it's that we're giving them public funding for something that doesn't have to be equally uh, compliant to all of all of the laws that uh, that govern public schools. Mm-hmm. Where charter schools have notoriously uh, kicked students out for basically nothing on on the basis of discipline um, and have largely not provided the same services for special education students, mm-hmm. um, especially here in Texas, uh, where – and not provided the same opportunities to teachers where – I mean all of those things um, – should be important to us at large. And sometimes it's about taking a step back. I was talking a, a while ago uh, in this about <laughs> um, about desegregation. And when it happened successfully in the 70s and 80s, what happened was that 
people who didn't have to buy in mm -hmm. bought in. Mm -hmm. um, and in the places where they have kept the desegregation plans that they started in the 70s and 80s and were successful, what happened is the wealthiest white people in those cities, it happened in Stamford, Connecticut, um, bought in and sent their kids to a low-income school and across the city and took a chance. Mm -hmm. And those schools are now incredibly successful and students from across the city get the same resources. Sometimes it's about setting aside your own interests in the in the interest of the greater good and understanding that that you know that that letting other students succeed doesn't mean that your kids are going to fail. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, hey, listen, in wrapping up and you know the the, the big question and not to anybody else, but mm -hmm. because I'm a political junkie, how did you get Julian Castro to endorse you? Do you know him? Is he a godfather? Or I mean, so how the fuck did that happen? <laughs> um, that happened uh, because of another endorsement. I don't know if you have the endorsement list that you're looking at there, um, but uh, former trustee Paul Saldana okay. um, yeah. uh, endorsed me. Um, he's a great guy. Uh, and was when he served on the board, one of only two uh, people of color serving on the board representing uh, a school district that is 70 percent minority. Right. Um, uh, he's he's a great guy. We sat down. He endorsed me, um, and uh, I think he he made a call um, to to the pack that represents them. They they were looking for uh, some people, especially in Texas, that that represent a little bit of a different look. Um, I mean, sure. his his group was endorsing primarily young candidates, but when I say young candidates, it was mostly like Andrew Gillum in Florida, <laughs> you know? somebody who's been Not mayor of a city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not George Bush, H. W. Bush. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I was uh, I skewed a little bit younger than than most of their, yeah, their yeah, candidates. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I hopped on a phone call with some of the people at Opportunity First, um, his his pack that was endorsing, um, and. They they liked what I had to say. Was this a, was this a was this partisan in any way? Because everybody that's endorsed you has been a Democrat. So like, is, was this partisan in any way? Because it's not supposed to be a partisan race, right? Oh, uh, was the endorsement partisan or was the race? Well, 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 no, the race is not partisan. Yeah. You guys are running as, as individual people with no party or any whatever. But like, so, but all your endorsements are Democratic. I mean, every, sure. the, the Travis County Dems endorsed you. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Gina Hinojosa, who I like, endorsed you. Mm -hmm. Endorsed you. I mean, so. Um, was it, I mean, it was largely a nonpartisan race. How did you get all these Democratic endorsements? I mean, obviously you're a Democrat, I would take it. Yeah, I know, I'm, I'm a Democrat. I'm, I'm, a, pro, I'm a progressive, um, and I've been incredibly involved. I, you know, I've worked with Gina Inahosa on a number of issues. That's mm -hmm. that's how I got her endorsement, not by being a token Democrat. It's because she knows I know what I'm talking about and okay. that I would be successful. She's a former Austin ISD trustee yeah, she herself. Is. Yeah, she is. Um, and she, you know, we sat down and talked about the issues, and she liked what I had to say. Okay. Um, you know, uh, same thing. With, with Paul Saldana, um, in terms of the the county Democratic Party endorsement, um, you know that that came from I I was a Democrat in the race. My opponent happened to be a Republican. I I do think that progressive values are important to our schools and our district. When you're talking about issues like uh, the district contracting with um, with uh, churches, for example, that that uh, practice uh, the condemnation of LGBT students, and then when in terms of that. Uh, partnership, we're forcing certain LGBT students to work with the church, mm -hmm. w with that church. That's not okay. And, and same thing with, with uh, employees and staff. Right. Um, and so I think so there, there are situations when those progressive values come into play, but it was more something I was happy to accept and work with than, than the focal point of my campaign. What was important to me was the priorities I was talking about, which was school safety, which was equity, making sure that every student in our district gets a chance to succeed, preventing sexual assault and uh, improving services for mental health. And that all came from my perspective as a student in this district. Mm -hmm. um, and that was so much more important to me than anyone's endorsement, including Julian Castro's. Right. But, I mean, uh, all of those it people... It is pretty rock star, though. I mean, it was, when you go get a job, you put that on a resume, oh, that's, you know, that's pretty badass. It was a good feeling. I tell you, the Austin Chronicle endorsed me, and that was about the best feeling in the world. I, got, I, I checked their website at about midnight, they dropped it, and I ran out into the middle of the street and screamed at midnight. <laughs> so I'm sure somebody was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's funny. Uh, you know, yeah, it was it, it was incredible to get those, but it was mostly an affirmation uh, of 
that they knew I knew what I was talking about and that sometimes it's important to take a chance on somebody who doesn't meet the traditional criteria. Well, especially with, Julian Castro because I mean, he's getting ready to run. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, last week he said some pretty cool stuff. He did, absolutely. But, but when I watched his dopey video announcing a couple months back, a month and a half ago, I was going, dude, he sounds like Obama 2.0. Yeah. It's typical corporate Dem crap. Now, if he really means single payer and everything else, mm-hmm. cool. I'm all, about, I'm all about that. I mean, and yeah. I want as many people to run as possible because I, I, I really want to see – and I want to see uh, from other parties too. I want to see the Greens really finally get it. But on a on a on a on a wow factor, that's a li- that's a resume line for life, man. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I he took a chance on me, and everyone who endorsed me did. And I like, I can't possibly repay that. Um, but the you know the yes, it, it, you can, my son. There's a lot of ways to repay that. <laughs> you don't understand. <laughs> it's good for business. Don't 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 say that. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, kidding. But, but no, it, it was incredible, but also an affirmation that that even though I am young, even though um, you know I I could not possibly have every single one of the traditional qualifications, mm-hmm. I know what the hell I'm talking about, mm-hmm. um, and that. And that, you know, it's time to have some different perspectives on the board and it's time to have give students a seat at the table. And I sure hope that if nothing else, that the other people who are running and the other members of the board and the superintendent were listening to what I was talking about, because if the board doesn't take action on mental health or sexual assault, um, doesn't take take action on making sure that every student in our district is getting um, equal services doesn't make sure that we go up to the legislature and tell them what's what this next session. Then we're not doing our jobs right. Right. Well, hey man, listen, we're 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 about wrapping up, but I'll tell you, um, thank you for uh, coming on, being a good sport. The show is called The Bitter Truth, not Big Wet Kiss. <laughs> so I think you knew that coming in. Absolutely. Which is cool. Um, but uh, and down the road, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's 2019. I mean, shoot, why not run for state assembly? <laughs> Seriously, but by, by the time you're out of school. You know, you, and you can totally do it. I mean, so why not? I mean, go for it. You know what I mean? All right, thanks. Um, but no, I'm, 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 I'm you know, I, it was a great conversation. I'm glad you came in. Absolutely. And uh, folks, my guest has been Zach Price, Zachary Price, and uh, he was a uh, uh, candidate for AISD District 4, and he's going to probably be running again. He's a young man. I don't think he's done. Um, but uh, listen, I talked about a lot of things. I'm sure it pissed you off and awesome. Maybe, maybe it made you think even more awesomer. And uh, you could always become a... Uh, a bitter pill by visiting patreon.com forward slash the bitter truth, where we can send you some freshly toasted bumper stickers. And uh, as always, folks, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, it's supposed to. Sleep tight.